with authority. We are now joined on a new special edition of our home quarantine with authority. We are with Shay Salinas of the San Jose Earthquakes. We are with Chris Alvarez as usual. Larry Beal is on assignment. I've always wanted to say that on assignment. So we have Julianne Herrera making her with authority debut. She's the uh, secret weapon we have behind the scenes that makes all this work. So Jules is the best. Uh, Shay, so we're going to get into a lot of very, very important things like chicken foods, dad chores, dad jokes, cool. all kinds of crazy fitness stuff. But I guess first we should probably start with the earthquake season, when it may possibly resume. There's a lot of rumors right now going on with the MLS that there might be something going on at the Disney uh, Wide World of Sports in Orlando. So uh, what do you know and what do you think of these rumors? Yeah, uh, what I know is that a lot of players, all of us want to play soccer again. Um, we want to we want to play soccer and we want it to be safe, um, but we're missing playing soccer. Uh, the problem, the difficulty is how to how to play soccer in all these different markets that have different restrictions and different things like that. Um, so the league has pitched this Disney idea that we all go to Disney and and kind of are in a giant quarantine together there and we play there. Um, obviously, there's a ton of stuff to figure out on how that would work logistically and safety wise and how families would be worked into all that so so where they stand on the the technicalities of all that i have no idea um i know that i I would miss my family a ton but i really want to play soccer also so uh it's difficult ideally coronavirus goes away and we could play soccer again in our own stadiums um but unfortunately that's not the reality so yeah that's that's kind of where soccer stands I wanted to dig in a little bit on the family aspect of that because I know you're a family man and I can't imagine having to be holed up somewhere at a resort away from my family. So, I mean, how tricky would that be for you? And do you know anything about like testing? What are they talking about? And have they briefed you guys much? Yeah, the, fa- the, the testing thing, they sound like they've, they've thought this through really, really well. That part, we would test before we left. We would test when we got there. We'd stay in like our team quarantine for a week or two and then, and then we would start to interact with other teams. Um, so I think they've thought the testing part through. I think they still have some concerns about staff, hotel staff and things like that that they're trying to figure out. Um, so, th- I mean, that part I'm not that worried about. Leaving my family for two months, I have a wife and three kids, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old. Uh, so leaving them for two months, I mean, we leave for two weeks during preseason, and it's tough on my wife. Uh, we live across the country from our family. And so uh, she has a lot of support with the church and everything, but it's still very difficult for a mom to take care of three kids with, without me around. Uh, so I, w- I want to be there helping her and helping my kids and loving on my kids. So two months away from them would be very difficult. Uh, so I'm still not really sure what I, what I would do if, if they say we need to go to Florida. I, I would have a tough decision to make. Shay, uh, Chris here. Um, Obviously, we're talking, we're seeing a lot of momentum for sports coming back. You have NASCAR, run a couple races, golf's going to come. Uh, soccer, you can't overly be socially distant on the field. But uh, yeah. what have you done as far as training goes, getting ready for a season that, that I, I hope the wheels are in motion that it's going to play. We all want to see you guys back on the field. So what are you doing training-wise to get ready? How does that work for you right now? Yeah, our, our staff, Earth, the Earthquake staff has done an amazing job of keeping us uh, fit, giving us programs, keeping us accountable. We have to send in our weight and our, our data and our workouts and stuff like that. Um, but they've given us a lot of content that we, we follow. Um, so I, I work out five times a week, um, lifting weights, running a lot. I don't have anyone to pass to, so I just kick the ball against the wall. Uh, but that's how I grew up. I grew up in Texas where no one really played soccer that much. So it was just me, a ball on a wall. Uh, so I'm back to that. Um, and then as far as uh, – I forgot, I forgot the other part that you asked. Uh, we're talking about kind of being socially distanced on the field. We saw uh, the, the yeah. – yeah, it's hard to do. Yeah, so it's hilarious. I don't know if you guys have watched the, the Germany – the Bundesliga started back up. And yes. on the sideline, guys are like six feet apart wearing masks. And when you score a goal, you're not allowed to celebrate with your teammates. And yet on corner kicks, guys are like wrestling and like hugging <laughs> each other. So I was like, this is – this is so – it's hilarious because they're trying as best they can to keep guys distance. But on the soccer field, you've got you've to be close to your guy. You've got to – especially the earthquakes, we play a man-marking system. So we pretty much know the guy's underwear size that we're marking by the end of the game. 
Uh, so it's all about being close to the man you're marking. So I don't know how soccer would work if we're not allowed to be close. Um, we got some good notes from uh, Jake of your PR staff. So, I mean, there's some fantastic stuff. I'm going to go to one that caught my eye. You scored your first goal against L.A. at Stanford Stadium, and you ripped your shirt off, but you had to ask your wife. Is that true? Uh, yeah, so so <laughs> uh, I, I had this feeling, this weird feeling before the game that I was going to score a goal. So I was, like, shaving my facial hair before the game, you know, getting ready for the game, about to put on my nice clothes. And I had my shirt off, and I have like five chest hairs. I don't, I don't grow hair very well. <laughs> and and I was, I was, I was looking at it, and I looked at my wife, and I was like, "Hey, if I score a goal, is it okay if I, if I uh, take my shirt off tonight?" I hadn't scored a goal all season, okay. Uh, so she's like, "Yeah, whatever. Yeah, you can take your shirt off. Like, what? That's fine." So I, sh- I shave my chest hairs, and I get ready for the game. Uh, and then you know, have you seen these like sports bras we have to wear that like track our data and stuff and our they're like GPS systems, but they look, yeah. they, they're like a so- sports bra. Well, our trainer comes up to me. He's like, Hey, uh, you got to wear this for the game. Like usual. And I was like, no, I'm not wearing that today. If I take my shirt off or if I score a goal, I'm going to take my shirt off. He's like, dude, you haven't scored a goal all year. Like, what are you talking about? But okay, whatever. So I get subbed in. I score in the 93rd minute to win the game. Shirt comes off, celebrate uh, in front of 50,000 people. It was, it was an epic moment in my career. Something I'll never forget. <laughs> Uh, speaking of epic moments in your career, I was told there's also a really good story about your MLS debut against David mm-hmm. Beckham and the LA Galaxy. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so I was drafted as a 21 year old young kid. I never uh, dreamed of being a professional soccer player, um, but somehow I, I'm playing I'm playing for the Quakes for preseason. The week before our first game, our starting forward doesn't show up to practice. And so our coach punishes him by benching him. And somehow he starts me. So my first professional game ever, I'm starting against the LA Galaxy. It's on ESPN. And it's one of David Beckham's first games ever in MLS. And David Beckham's a guy that I, I mean, everyone idolized uh, and still do, still does. Uh, but I like looked up to this guy and Landon Donovan, him, him both, uh, Landon and David both. And so the game's about start. I remember being in the tunnel and being pretty nervous. And I can, like, the tunnel's kind of, like, there's, like, covering. So I can kind of see that it's crowded. It's really crowded. There's, like, fireworks going off, so it's smoky. And then Landon Donovan and David Beckham come and stand right next to me. And we're about to take the field. And I remember just sitting there in awe of them like this. And my teammate behind me noticed, and he slaps me on the back of the head. He goes, focus, kid. So I, like, shook that off, take the field. And... I remember playing horribly. I remember the only t- the only thing I could think about for so I mean this I was such a young kid. I remember just chasing David Beckham around, and every time I got close to him, thinking, "Oh, I might be on ESPN right now because sure, surely the camera's on David Beckham. So if I could get close enough to him, I'm I'm on TV." And I remember like try- like he would kick it, and I would come like really late and like shoulder bump him, and be like, "Yeah, I just shoulder bumped David Beckham." Uh, and I thought, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I got subbed in like the 60th minute pretty early in the game and played horribly. But thankfully, we lost 2-0. David Beckham scored a goal. Uh, but thankfully, I got to play him a few more times and was more focused on playing soccer than touching David Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> Did you always play winger? So were you like kind of like on de- like playing up against him on defense that game a lot? Yeah, so uh, I was forward in that game in particular, but uh, I usually am a winger. So I, the the next few games we played them, I was more up against him and Landon sometimes would play over there as well. Um, but that game, I would like track back. I was playing forward, so I would just track back on defense unnecessarily just so I could be next to him. <laughs> That's the beauty of the winger position. You can yeah. drop back whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, that David Beckham's still a legend, and Landon Donovan as well. It's, it's been cool to play against some uh, big-name players in the, in the MLS. So I'm looking at the live stream. We have a lot of Earthquakes fans joining us, so I'm going to say shout-out <clears> to the <throat> Earthquakes fans for stopping yeah, by. Hey and, guys. Uh, Del Simone actually says he would have loved to see the sports bra, so I don't know what that's about. But <laughs> oh, <laughs> Well, you know, th- I thought about it recently th- during the women- after the Women's World Cup after they won again. I thought it would be cool to score a goal and then mimic the Brandy Chastain celebration. I know Netflix just has doc- released their documentary uh, about them winning the World Cup, but that would be cool. Now that we do wear sports, sports balls as well, 
ripping the shirt off and doing the Brandy Chastain like knee slide would be would be pretty funny. All right, so I I've waited long enough. We have to get into chicken coop talk. Yes, uh, you yes. are right now in Santa Clara building a chicken coop. My wife has ordered a chicken coop that I have to build. I have no idea where to find chickens. So how did you get onto this, and what is going yeah. on with all that? Yeah, I, I was totally against the idea uh, at first, but my wife was for the idea, so obviously it happened. Yep. Uh, that's that's kind of how marriage <laughs> works. <laughs> so uh, she convinced me, though, because she's like, I, I love eating eggs. And she said, if we get five chickens, they can give us 24 eggs a week. And I'm all about that. I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. She did like a whole spreadsheet about how – how long it would take for them to pay for themselves and all this stuff. And so, so then she's like, well, you have to build a chicken coop and a chicken run. And so she found these plans online. Uh, it came with the materials list. I went to home Depot and bought a ton of wood and now I'm building a chicken coop. She also convinced our friends to buy chickens and I'm building their coop as well. So two chicken coops, it's been a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. You can come build my chicken coop too. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I mean, I do like, I love woodworking. I love doing this stuff. Um, but my wife, she, she puts a lot of change orders in. Like every day she comes out there. She's like, you know, I think we should add, like make it a half playhouse. So you have to put doors here and make it a playhouse as well. Or you should put in windows. And so every day it's like, this is a never ending project. I love that it's so official that you actually are using the term change orders in regards to the changes mm. she's having you make. <laughs> we, uh, I have the contractor and she is the client. That's amazing. Okay, so I was looking at your Instagram page. It reminded me a lot of mine because I have I have two young children. Uh, we're at home quarantined too. I've been just building and doing all kinds of projects. So what is like your most impressive, I guess, non-chicken coop dad project that you've done oh. during this period of time? Yeah, that's good. Um, my we, we had a TV wall that was just a blank wall and my wife was looking at like Ikea shelving and stuff like that, but none of it was going to fit well. So she's the brains behind all of this. She designed this, uh, this built in thing with a bench that opens and cabinets. And so I built it. I pretty much did ca like nice cabinetry and built these built ins around our TV. And if I was home, I'd show you, it looks awesome. Uh, but that's my like, proudest moment. But with the kids, the dad moment is my son wanted a skateboard. I really don't like skateboards. I, think, I mean, I skate skateboarding is amazing. I was never good at it. And I hurt, just hurt myself a lot doing it. So I was like, buddy, I don't really want to, I don't want you to get a skateboard. And he was begging for a skateboard. So out of a bunch of wood, we built a skateboard uh, and it doesn't roll very fast. And he played with it for like 10 minutes, but it took us like two hours to build. But that was a really cool moment because we built a skateboard together, me and my son. That's beautiful, man. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, I guess my proudest dad moment would be uh, I wired all the lights in our house to work by voice. That was pretty cool. Oh, that's amazing. That was about That's it. Great. But, but do your kids know how to turn them off and on? <laughs> yes. My daughter, my oldest yeah. daughter is seven and my youngest one's three. And the biggest problem is between knowing how to turn all the lights on and off, they also know how to play who let the dogs out in kingdom <laughs> style. So it's, it's yes. just torture. It's torture. Yeah, right Ale now. Alexa, Alexa plays poo poo pee pee songs all day. <laughs> like, uh, hey, Alexa, play the poo poo song. And some, somehow there's like five poo poo songs that, that she plays and, so that's all I hear all day. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's an Alexa. Life. There's an Alexa right next to me, and now it's playing that song. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> I swear. That's hilarious. Shay, I don't know if you guys can hear it. Shay, it wasn't originally on my list of questions for you, but as I'm hearing you talk about your wife, and I heard you talk about David Beckham, you obviously were in awe of David Beckham when you saw him, but when you met your wife, were you in awe? And how did you pop the question? Was yeah. that the most nervous you've ever been in your life? Yeah, uh, not the most nervous I've been. I was pretty confident she was going to say yes. Uh, <laughs> Good. But when, when I did meet my wife, there, I still like, can visualize it. We're, we both went to Furman University in South Carolina. Somehow we got paired up to do this like dance together, like her group of friends and my group of friends. And I remember her walking down some stairs, and she was wearing pink shorts and I mean, all, all of the, all of the girls are like, you know, like sorority girls, but I remember specifically seeing her and be like, wow, that she, she is beautiful. Uh, and then it took me like three months for her to actually like me. And then we dated and I screwed things up along the way, but won her back and 
then so when we got engaged uh we were we went skiing with her family on family trip and it was it was after my first year of playing professional soccer i probably shouldn't tell the story so we're not allowed to ski and uh oh and so, it's okay and so, so she was though. yeah this, this was 13 years ago uh so she was really scared that i was going to get injured and so um the whole time she's like be careful be careful she must have said it like a thousand times a day and so one time we're skiing i scouted out the mountain and there's this one like really private trail that no one really went down i said hey let's go down this one uh so we're skiing down and i let her get ahead of me and i popped one of my skis off and she rounded the corner and i waited a little bit and then i went down and i kind of was holding my knee kind of skiing down slowly and she's like, what happened? What happened? I said, oh, I hurt my knee. It hurt my knee. It's really bad. And I go down to one knee and it's like, it's like three degrees, freezing cold, but I have the ring in my pocket and I'm like, oh, I heard it. I heard it. And she's like, oh my gosh, I knew this was going to happen. We shouldn't have gone skiing. And I like play it up for like two or three minutes. And it's really serious. And then finally I pop my glove off and I'm like, Hey, uh, I said, I don't know, some sweet stuff. And she, and I said, will you marry me? And she's like, first she says, no, I always give her a hard time. Cause she told me, no, like, three times she's like no this isn't the time for that and i'm like no i'm not injured like I, I i really want to spend the rest of my life with you we marry me she's like no we need to get you to the hospital we need to figure this out <laughs> finally after my hands like getting frostbite she realizes that i'm really not injured and she says yes and so that's how i asked her to marry me and that is a great been, story yeah. where were that's you good. where were you when you were skiing we we're in bozeman montana in uh, montana okay yeah we're uh, skiing uh big sky or uh, Moonlight Basin, those two. It was amazing. That that Love is that, a, that is a great story. <laughs> that is a great story. Actually, speaking of injuries, we looked at again some of the research we were doing on you. Um, you didn't think you were gonna make it to soccer, and you actually got hurt in a flag football game. Like, got all busted <laughs> up, and then you're still you're still and like, look where you are now. So, can you tell the viewers about that story? Speaking of actual injuries, yeah. Uh, for me to become a professional soccer player, God was like so evident. Um, I, w I was somehow invited to the combine, the MLS combine. They do all these like mock drafts online. I wasn't on any of them, um, but I get invited to the combine. So I'm really excited to go. And a week before the combine, I'm playing flag football with some guys. And I do a, I just, I run into a guy essentially and shatter my orbital socket underneath my eye and, and fracture a few bones in my face. And so the doctor says, hey, you can't play soccer for uh, six to eight weeks until some of that heals. Otherwise, your eye might move and you might get double vision. And, you know, he just played this whole thing up. He was probably right. But uh, I was just thinking, I, I, mean, I want to play soccer. Um, so I, I pretty much everyone told me not to play. So my, I initially, I decided not to play. And I was just going to go and watch. And as I'm flying there to watch the combine, I thought, there's no way I'm going to be able to watch 50 guys play for my dream job. Uh, so I need to at least give it a try. So they did the physicals and I told them that they're like, what happened to your face? My eyes like black and blue. My cheek is like out to here. And I, I said, you know, I, it's fine. It's not a big deal. And so they just looked me over. This was a long, this was, uh, 13 years ago. So I guess they were less strict on concussions and all that stuff. Uh, so they're like, okay, you can play. So I played and I remember playing okay, pretty, pretty well, but not great. Um, I get back from the combine. I check all those mock drafts again. I'm not on any of them. So I was like, well, you know, I tried. I, I, I gave it up my all. If I don't get drafted, that's fine. I have no regrets. Um, somehow I get drafted 15th overall, first pick of the second round. And I'm like blown away. Uh, and the coaches, the coach calls me and I, I mean, I was just watching it by myself. I never expected to get, to get picked. Um, and so I said, why did you pick me? And he said, we, we found out you're playing with a shattered face. And we thought, you know, we want guys with that type of toughness. We want guys that, are, that can play through injury and are tough. And so that really attracted us to you. So that's why we picked you. And it was a crazy moment because what I thought was the end of my soccer career was actually what, what started it was a catalyst for it. And so it was pretty cool how, the, yeah, what I thought was going to be horrible turned out to be a pretty cool event. So drafted that was to san jose in 2008 wow. and at the time you didn't know where san jose was right uh, you're from <laughs> texas <laughs> you have to look yeah, it up guys, on a map you guys, yeah you guys did your research i i was going to firm university in south carolina i get drafted by san jose and i'm like what where is, what is this i thought it was in costa rica or something i was like so i google it I'm like, <laughs> oh Cal california that sounds cool and then i figure out the difference between norcal and socal and uh 
so now, but now I've lived here for most of my, I mean, not most of my life, but a lot of my life. And now this is home. So uh, it's, it's been crazy. Yeah, California, one of the good things here is obviously the Mexican food, which I've heard mm -hmm. you're a fan of. So during this shelter in place time, what's, are you able to get your Mexican food yeah. fix or where's your go to <laughs> spot for that? Yeah, I usually I usually cook. Uh, I don't have a go I had a go to spot. It was like this hole in the wall joint down the street from my house, but it burned down. So it was like really hole in the wall. So I imagine it's like probably a grease fire or something. But and now it's like a dentist place. So that was really sad. Uh, so I cook a lot. My wife cooks a lot. Um, but chorizo and eggs is my favorite thing with tortillas in the morning. Um, but I still miss Cali. Cali Mex is a bit different than Tex Mex. I still miss my Tex Mex food. Yeah, what's the comparison there? Texas Mexican food versus California. You won't hurt our yeah. feelings. You be honest. I, I feel like California Mexican food is kind of fancy. It's like guacamole and it kind of looks pretty. And I think of Aki's. Like Aki's, the restaurant has like really pretty, nice food. Uh, I'm used to just like refried beans with cheese and just everything mixed together and you slurp it up with tortilla. And yeah, that's what I'm used to. <laughs> But all Mexican food out of guacamole. This is news no, to me. No, no, <laughs> I mean, not that much in Texas. Also in quarantine, uh, what have you been binge watching? You're a Modern Family fan, right? That's a great show, yeah. but obviously their season, all their seasons just ended recently. Yeah. So what, yeah, what's does, the go-to? Yeah, does, uh, does, does PJ Masks or Paw Patrol count? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, man. Yeah, that's that's all that's all I could get. That's all my kids will. We don't we don't really do TV that much. Um, I just started um, taking classes towards getting my master's degree. So any downtime, I'm writing econ papers right now. Um, so not not doing a lot of TV. So yeah, when we do watch TV, the kids will watch like 20 minutes of PJ Masks. I can tell you all about Owlette and Gecko. Cat boy. Casey probably knows. Oh, yeah. Cat boy, Romeo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know all yeah. that stuff, man. We we have to watch that, and then we have to play the game, uh, the PJ Masks game, where I have to let my daughter be outlet, and and she beats me up, and I'm night ninja. <laughs> 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 oh, that's that's great. That sounds Dude, awesome. It's funny because you you mentioned you mentioned PJ Masks. You mentioned chorizo and eggs. Actually, I make that every Wednesday for my family. They they love it, and then uh, and we've also both spent time in San Quentin. So, what is your impressions of being in there? Yeah, I was impressed. Um, I I had pictured I have I have uh, some some men that I help out that have been in the prison systems and they've explained to me the the racism and they call it uh, the the politics of of prison. And so I was kind of picturing that when I went there and what I had heard from them. And when I went there, I was impressed because the I, we went there to play soccer with them. And there's men of every race playing soccer, um, and they're they're competitive. They they were respectful and kind. Um, they were well spoken. A lot of them were taking classes, getting their education. They were uh, cooking and working within the prison system. So there's a lot of programs there. Um, so I was just really impressed by San Quentin as a whole. And, and I talked to one of them. He said they used to be very political, and there used to be different yards with for the different races. And he said about three, four years ago, they, they stopped doing that. And it was really difficult. There was a lot of violence when they stopped. Um, but essentially, they, he said they were just shipping guys out that wouldn't conform to, to, to living uh, lives together. Um, and so now it's, it's, a, it's a neat place where a lot of men are getting transformed and uh, kind of trying to redeem their, their lives. Yeah, that was like for me – you kind of come down this big hill and, and then you make the turn and you can see kind of like the whole grounds of where they're playing basketball and, and exercising and playing soccer. I went with the Golden State Warriors a few years ago. Yeah. And the most striking thing to me was it's really all about rehabilitation. And the guys that yeah. I talked to in there like could not have been nicer guys. And it was interesting because mm -hmm. they all really wanted us just to tell their story. Like, you know, here's what we're up to. Here's what we're doing. Like, this is the good stuff that's happening. And I, I mean, it was not at all what I expected. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I got to watch the I watched the Golden State Warriors documentary uh, about them going, and then when I was there, 
during the soccer game, I kind of walked over to the basketball court and watched them play, and those guys are they're really good. <laughs> Um, we got to wrap up pretty soon, but uh, just getting back to the Quakes in this season in your teammates, I mean, what are you most looking forward to? Who are you missing the most? Like, what are you just really just itching to do with the boys again? Oh, compete. I miss competing. Um, that's that's why I've played professional soccer for so long. I love competing. I love small-sided games. I love winning. Uh, so, I mean, I don't. it's not even just winning. I just love competing, uh, just giving it your all and – and throwing it all out there. So I miss that. I miss the banter with the guys. Like when you do win, you know, you kind of give everyone else a hard time and you got to take it when you lose. Uh, so specifically I miss competing and I miss bantering with all my teammates. Uh, just, it's not, you got to be on your toes in the locker room. There's always someone coming at you. and Usually you're coming at someone. And so it's, it's fun. I miss that. Yeah. You guys should be in Canada. I think right now uh, to play Montreal tomorrow, oh. if everything was on track. So. Yeah, it's funny. The other day we got a text message. I think we were supposed to be – I don't know where we were supposed to be, but someone said if the season would still be going, we'd be in a foot of snow. Somewhere it was like snow where we were supposed to be playing. I was like, well, it's kind of nice, actually, that we're not there. <laughs> but, hey, Shay, California uh, sunshine. Yeah. Shay, we're talking about obviously getting back, and I was at the store and I saw the Sports Illustrated. It has this very powerful image of, of no fans Wow. And that's likely what you guys are going to see. I mean, I j just bought it because I think this will be like a collector's item one day. Um, playing in front of no fans at first, like what do you think that's going to be like? You talked about seeing the German soccer league and what it was like there, but how much do your fans help you in a game? And, and what do you think it's going to be like without fans? Play playing in front of fans is definitely better. Um, I think it makes the quality of soccer a little bit better. It's obviously just better for us. Like it's just more fun, but at the same time, Compete, competition is competition. We grew up playing with no fans. At least I did. Uh, and so, so I don't think it'll affect me that much. When, when the, I, I ignore the fans when we're in the, sta when we're in the stadium. Uh, people, my, even my son's like, hey, did you hear me yell at you, for you? And I'm like, I usually tell him yes, but in reality, no, I have no I, I didn't. Uh, so, man, it, it, whether there's fans there or not, essentially it's me versus the guy across the field. Um, and that's, that's what I want to, that's what I focus on. I think a lot of guys do the same thing. So being out on the field with no fans, I'm fine with it. It's, it's how I grew up playing and I don't mind going back to it. Unless of course it's David Beckham in the stands then you might get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think if, if David Beckham's there, there'd probably be a bunch of people there. <laughs> Casey. All right, well, we'll wrap it up. Thank you to the Earthquakes fans for joining us on the live stream. Uh, we'll have this whole episode up on YouTube. We're going to be all over the podcast platforms, every platform, Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud. So thank you for joining us. Also, check us out on abc7news.com. Shay, thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us. Thank you so much for uh, giving me a little bit of chicken poop insight. And, uh, we really appreciate that. And, man, we can't wait to see you out there with Tom, Tom, and Wando and all the homies. Yeah, I miss it too. I, I can't wait to see you all out there. Hopefully we'll be playing again soon. Thanks guys for having me. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. With authority.